economist at Berenberg Bank in London, David Riley, head of sovereign ratings at credit agency Fitch, the economist and author Norena Hertz, and the fund manager Joanna Kirkland from Schroders. David Riley, can I start with you? I mean, just to pick up on uh, something in my um, piece there, there's a sense that there's no middle way now with the euro. If they're going to hold it together, they have to take a big step towards fiscal union. And yet, it doesn't seem like anyone in Germany or in a lot of other places is ready for that to happen. Is that the, is that the basic fact that we're facing? Um, that seems to be really what the market has been now concluding and, and demanding, which is um, either we have effectively a United States of Europe or the Eurozone is not viable and, and, and the Euro will um, disappear certainly in, in, in its current form. I think what's interesting is that um, increasingly the market is pushing policymakers and, and Germany in particular um, closer to the position where it's going to have to adopt um, some of the policies which it's not wanted to do, which will take it closer to fiscal union. So for example, I suspect they will start dusting off plans for a common uh, euro bond uh, which will issue for, for everybody, will be joint and severally um, guaranteed. If they increase the size of the European Financial Stability Facility, essentially the sort of rescue fund, um, that also could ultimately become like a sort of debt management agency, if you like, for, for Europe. So I think they are being pushed towards fiscal union, but they're being pushed, but they're kicking and screaming um, along the way. I mean, Holger Schmieding, just for the, the German perspective on this, I mean, two weeks ago, the Germans were not ready even for that, even for a common euro bond of some kind, that kind of collective support behind the debt. You know, does it just take every few weeks another market crisis to push Germany down this road? There is something to that. Yes, it takes one crisis sort of after the other to push the Germans towards that. But the Germans will always exact the price. What the Germans will always be asking for at each stage is if we, the Germans, have to issue stronger guarantees than you, our partners, please subject yourselves to stronger fiscal surveillance. So it's a mutual process. If Italy is ready to put a balanced budget amendment into its constitution, then the Germans are ready to grant more. So it's a mutual process okay. of the two sides coming but, together. But, uh, Norina, we're talking about, when you talk about surveillance, you're talking about Germany getting more and more, in, in, in return for the money, Germany getting more and more control over other countries' policies. Mm. I mean, do you think that can happen? Do you think that's a, something democratic that could happen? Well, I think it's very worrying, and I think, I think in Germany in particular, Angela Merkel is having to walk a very um, tight line between what Europe needs and what her domestic electorate are wanting. I mean, we've got to remember that she had a bad election in the federal elections, the CDU, and, you know, and so for her to sell to the German people this plan and Germany bailing out essentially the rest of Europe is going to be problematic, and then imposing in return austerity programmes um, potentially on countries that are barely coping is not going to be good for Europe. It's not going to be good for any of us. But do you think, I mean, that's a good point, actually. I mean, do you, do you think, uh, Johanna, that uh, countries are getting forced into policies that actually could be counterproductive for growth, counterproductive for their economy? Or as far as you're concerned, I mean, you're managing billions of dollars worth of assets, you can never have too much fiscal austerity? How does it work? Well, no, I mean, I think, unfortunately, we do need the politicians to get ahead of the curve that to some extent, they have to shock and awe the markets with what they're doing. Okay, but and what the happens if they can't? I guess the problem is the last few weeks we seem to be seeing that they can't. Yeah, so I think that what's, what they'll continue doing, I think, is potentially buying themselves time. And so for in the medium term, sorry, in the short term, the markets are going to have to keep on focusing on, on this sort of news flow. And the reality is that we're not going to get a sustained rise in equity prices while this situation is ongoing. And that's particularly while economic growth globally is weak. So I think really for, for markets to, to enter sustained uptrend, what we need is on the one hand um, a, a credible solution out of Europe. I think that will take a long time. Um, and on the other hand, something that maybe will come sooner is some kind of improvement in the economic statistics, which we're not seeing at the moment. I'm sort of interested to ask you, I mean, it's, it's been mildly nauseating the last few days, the way the Chancellor has sort of crowed here about how we're a safe haven and no one's uh, worried about our commitment to cutting the deficit. I assume that means that you're, you're piling into the UK in a big way with your funds. Um, I wouldn't say that, but I think that certainly the UK has one major advantage relative to the Eurozone, and that is the ability to weaken their currency relative to some of the member states within the Eurozone. And I think that has been a huge advantage. And I think that comes back to the point that you were just asking me about earlier, which is um, from the perspective of an investor, you know, is, is there any such thing as 
too, li too much austerity? Well, actually, there is. I mean, ultimately, we want to see growth, especially yeah. if you're investing in the equity markets. Um, and the fact that uh, there's this fundamental rigidity in the Eurozone and that the countries that are struggling can't devalue their currencies, which was the way that, for example, the Asian economies got out of their crisis, is a concern. So it's a, it's a careful uh, line we're treading here. On the one hand, we want uh, the European policymakers to show that they're ahead of the curve. Um, but at the same time, we don't want austerity measures that are too extreme because ultimately that means a lost decade for growth in Europe. Exactly, like Japan. And yes. That was the problem in Japan, of course, in 96, 97, yeah. when, you know, when they did try and balance the budget far too quickly and ended up with this lost decade, which we're now potentially facing But in there Europe. was a political paralysis at the heart of that as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that is why it's an example perhaps of what I was talking about in the film that the, the politicians were yes but do were, we have Stephanie the uh, capability the capacity and the leadership here in Europe to move us out of a state of paralysis Polish media, media, sure. the Germans that lead us out if anyone does I would say to that <laughs> namely when we look at what's happening in Europe look through the turmoil we are actually seeing a wave of structural reforms we are seeing the labor market reforms the pension reforms that is Europe beneath the surface beneath the noise is actually delivering all the things which in the end will make the place better, which is if Europe manages to buy time, mm. after that time is over, continental Europe will be in a much better shape than it is today. But structural reform is going to take years. And in that process, we're going to have millions more people unemployed. We're going to have consumer confidence collapsing. David Wright, sorry, just sorry. David Wright, the point that is a worry, isn't yeah. it? That you're, you, OK, say we assume that uh, there's just going to be slow movements, uh, Germany with a gun to its yeah. head, moving closer and closer to a fiscal union. Doesn't that, even in the best of all worlds, doesn't it condemn Europe, large parts of it, to a very slow growth for years? Um, it, it does potentially, um, but I actually don't think that's going to be a viable strategy. Um, I think what actually needs to happen, the market's not going to wait um, for structural reforms to transform Italy into a dynamic economy. Um, and uh, Essentially, there's a real risk now of a self-fulfilling, not just a self-fulfilling liquidity crisis, but a self-fulfilling solvency crisis. Italy and Spain are solvent, but if the market is saying we're only willing to lend to you at seven or eight percent over the medium term, then they will become but, they will become insolvent. I mean, you're, you're so the ECB of, has to intervene. It must intervene. But is that can the European Central Bank be a, be a stopgap in this? It hasn't got any. It, it would say it was a, that was a fundamentally political act, and it is an independent institution. It's not supposed to be just taking the, doing the job of government. The yes. European Central Bank can do exactly what the Bank of England does, yes. what the Fed has done. Yes. The European Central Bank is an extremely powerful institution. If they step up to the plate, which they reluctantly will likely do, they can defuse the crisis. And if we, again, make these comparisons, always remember the Eurozone has as a unit a fiscal deficit which is much smaller than that of the US and the UK, which means if they want to, they can get things under control. They just have to be pushed well, to, to do it. I need to get, actually, because yeah. we, we haven't got very much longer, and uh, obviously this news about the US is quite important uh, tonight, uh, and uh, I think you know, we've been talking about paralysis of politicians, and we started the week looking at uh, rather paralysed American yeah. politicians. Mm. David, I should get your reaction to the news about Standard & Poor, and them taking away the US AAA I, credit rating. Yeah, I think uh, Standard & Poor's I think signalled their intent to downgrade the, the, the US. I don't think it will come as a surprise. Um, Is I, it going to be, are we going to see a real market reaction to that on Monday? Is this the end of the world? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I suspect so, that we no. won't, to be honest. I think the market's focused on growth and cares much more about that than the, it cares the at the moment about downgrades. Yeah, I think from the perspective of the markets, what we need at the moment is some kind of stabilisation in the economic data. Oh. Because if growth improves, yeah. then that helps to put some of these sovereign debt concerns on the back burner. I think with respect to the downgrade, potential downgrade yeah. of the United States, the reality is it's still one of the most highly rated economies. Yeah. And so actually it won't provoke a sell-off in US bonds necessarily. It yeah. might set, provoke a sell-off in lower rated bonds as people try to reshuffle their portfolios so to basically the, the US stays top dog and then everyone yeah. else is going to lose their AAA as well. Well, I don't know about that, but certainly I think that um, the, the, the market dynamics are still going to be favourable for the US Treasury market yeah. for the moment, in spite of the downgrade. Well, gosh, really, do you think, you know, we do spend a lot of time complaining about European politicians' inability to get to grips with their problems. Do you see some of the same kind of paralysis in the US? Do you think we're, being, we're, we're too kind to American politicians? I think we actually are seeing worse paralysis in the US. In the Eurozone, we have the experience over the last 18 months. I There's a crisis, they always react. 
and in the end they managed to defuse the crisis. In the US we have this stupid situation that we had, they just cannot agree to actually borrow for a while, so the Euro Eurozone has problems, but it's not that dysfunctional. It just is rather noisy. But it's, well, I, you say noisy. I don't think anyone looking at the Eurozone in the last few weeks would recognise your description of them fixing the problem. Norina. No, they're not fixing no. the problem I mean, yet. I th I think but this after, is a once, once they, ha they react to problems, now they have one, and we'll see on Monday how they react. I think Norina it's has. a particularly toxic cocktail right now. On the one hand, we have the US, very yeah. flat growth, flatlining. We have unemployment high there. Yes, the unemployment figures were a little bit better, but still high, and this potential downgrade. And on the other hand, we have Europe, with the Eurozone now widening the crisis to Spain and Italy. The one on its own would have been worrying. Two together, can the world cope? I'm not sure. I think double dip. Johanna, okay. is the answer, if you're an investor, just to get out of America and the US? Do you just go to emerging markets? No, I don't. One sentence. Um, certainly, I would avoid Europe for the time being, yes. Till they fix their problems, which could be... Which could take forever. a while, but in the meantime, I think there are opportunities, both in the United States and emerging economies. Thank you very much to all of you. I just want to get a chance to uh, have a look at uh, tomorrow's uh, front pages. The FT, uh, predictably, it's a big day for the FT. Grim week echoes depths of 2008 crisis. And... Uh, where are you, EU and the Independent? Britain takes a £150 billion blow as debt chaos hits economy, so not such a safe haven, according to the Times. And uh, British team, that story we've had uh, today, the British team killed by a polar bear in Norway. And the male going its own way, Eton pupil killed by polar bear. Well, that's all from Newsnight. Tonight, we'll leave you with the sight of NASA's Juno spacecraft heading for Jupiter. It'll take five years to get there, by which time, if you're an optimist, you might say this planet's economy might just have sorted itself out. Good night. <laughs>